Hello, everyone. First of all, <laughs> how is everyone doing? Okay. Um, we're thinking of Lompoc Senego with, with obviously great gratitude. And I was just reflecting on what Ajahn Chah, um, what Ajahn Chah said when he was asked how old he was. He said, I have no age. Because when you think you're born, it's already a problem. I'm sure Ajahn Sumedha would answer similar, uh, because Nopal Sumedha's emphasis is always on the unconditioned, the deathless, the unborn. And there are lots, there's lots in Buddhism which talks about rebirth and you know that we are all brothers and sisters in a past lifetime, but notice Lompa never talks that way. He never he never goes to that Buddhist conceptual structure of rebirth. He always takes us to the unconditioned. And to me, that's the hallmark of his um, brilliance in always presenting uh, and reminding us of that. Um, so the way I like to do that reminders, you know, those of you who've practiced with me, to use that metaphor of foregrounded background. So I'll do that. We'll meditate for half an hour, and then we'll see where, where this session goes. So please set yourself up for a meditation. I'll set my wee clock. So Settle into the moment, listen to sound. To listen to sound, you have to stop thinking. Let the sounds come to you. Notice the changing nature of sound. Notice the unchanging awareness. You can't notice awareness as an object, but you can be aware. Notice the changing nature of sound. And then there's the silence of awareness. And be that awareness. Feel the breathing of your body. Just let the body be felt, be known, be conscious, breathing in, breathing out. Not a hard focus. Notice the change in nature of breath. Awareness is unchanging. Notice the change in nature of bodily feelings and breath. Awareness is unchanging. Move between the two, listen to sound. Feel the body. They're both changing. What is unchanging? Be that awareness. Listen to sound. Sound is the foreground of change. Background is the knowing or the awareness. Be the background. Feel the body. Bodily feelings are changing. Awareness, background, be the background. So you're not trying to become anything, you're just remembering that the foreground changes, the background is peaceful and silent. Be that background. 
be the knowing, be aware. Make that awareness very open and welcoming. So welcome all conditions. Let them come, let them go. You're like the silent witness. So non-becoming, we're not trying to get anywhere. Non-resistance, acceptance of whatever. Clear knowing, it's like this. So then if we use Lopas brilliant words, when you get entangled in time, memory, you notice that, just say it's like this. But then come to that silence, notice change. Don't try to get something, just notice change. It's like this. Okay, so let's sit quietly and meditate quietly. Bodily feelings are in awareness. Awareness is conscious space. Body comes and goes in awareness. Sound is in awareness. Thoughts are in awareness. Emotions are in awareness. Just trust in that.
Notice how a thought ends in awareness. Awareness is there. Rather than trying to get rid of thinking, notice the thinking gets interrupted by a pain in the leg, a sound, and you're there. And notice that thought is an object. Awareness is the background.
you forget all tangled and planning and worrying and such like. The moment that's interrupted, then go back to sound. Just listen. And then notice the changing nature of sound. And that awareness knows change. Return. It's a very simple model, practice. And then trust in that knowing of change. Of course, you have to do it again and again. Return to that simple understanding. So the knowing isn't conceptual. It's not like making a comment about, oh, it's all changing. It's not that. It's the silence of witnessing.
Okay, let's stop there. In your eyes, stretch your legs a bit if you'd like. Are we good for sound, Vita? Yes, Lampa. Okay. <clears throat> good evening, Lampa. Shenzhen, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Hope you're well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Lung Paul, we would now like to request for the Dhamma. Please, yeah. The Brahma God, Sahampati, Lord of the world, with palms joined in reverence, requested a favor. Beings are here with but little dust in their eyes. Pray, teach the Dhamma out of compassion for them. Brahma Chaloka Tipati Sahampati Katanjaliyan Tiwarangaya Chata Santita Sata Jatika Dese to Daman Anuka Piman Paja. Namo Tassa, Bakawato, or Hato, Sama, Sam, Tassa. Namo Tassa, Bakawato, or Hato, Sama, Sam, Tassa. Namo tassa pakawato varahato sama sam tassa uttang dhammang sankhang namasam. Hello everyone, namaste. Hope you're well. So we are reflecting, celebrating, remembering, expressing gratitude for Papa Sumedho's life on this 90th birthday and and I was uh, as I was saying I think if you asked him how old are you he said I have no age body has age and to me that's been that's been central for my my relationship to him as a teacher because even in Nana Chats in the early days years ago he was always using that those phrases, there's the unconditioned, the uncreated, the unoriginated, the unformed, the deathless. And I was always pointing to why we became monks, we ordained for the sake of the realization of Nibbana. Lopo Cha as well said, once you think you're born, it's already a problem. And that's a pretty radical way of thinking. And if it's taken shallowly, it just seems kind of ridiculous because there is the body. A 90-year-old body is not a 50-year-old body, and there is still the, the comma of a body, and there's still the experience. But one of the one of the things about Long Paul's many, many things about Long Paul's teaching was never about opinions. There's always something you could you could you could reflect on and look in your own mind. It wasn't something you had to believe. So it was never about who was reborn where or what rebirth was like and who had powers and this kind of um, talk that was sort of like Buddhist gossip, I suppose, that around. And, and he was never interested in that. I, I wasn't interested in that either. But I was interested in, in the language of the uncreated because that seemed to me the whole purpose of this, uh, this teaching. And the, whole, the kind of thrust of his teaching was always that and so now as we as we like in the mornings we're leading opa's book don't take your life personally it's just brilliant he's just he just nails it he's just so good um and yet and yet the themes are always the same it's it's like this and and what he does for me with that that brings me to silence it's not an opinion. It's not something I have to believe. It's something I have to 
remember to engage that that language of it's like this. But it's not just a sort of facile statement, oh, life is like this. No, it's much, much more than that. It's the silence after that statement. It's the noticing of change. Because the like Anicca Sanya, the perception of change in, in, the, in the practices of mindfulness, it's not a it's not a Buddhist position. Because we do that as Buddhists. We do the Buddhist thing. We say, oh yeah, it's all changing, the weather's changing. But it doesn't take a Buddha to realize that. But actually to have enough attention on, let's say, an emotion, and say the emotion feels like this, like anxiety, let's say. If you feel anxiety, you have enough trust, as Lopo has been teaching us, enough trust and awareness to say, awareness is like, uh, anxiety is like this. Then there's the silence and the knowing of the unpleasantness of the anxiety, of the feeling, of the thoughts. That's different than just saying, oh, anxiety will change. Don't worry about it, darling. You'll be okay. That's not it. It will change, but it's much, much more profound than that. And to trust in that, and you know, to trust in that this experience of, of worry or fear or sadness or grief arises because it causes the conditions, and we know that. You know, we, we have that teaching all the time, but this sense of really knowing change, I mean, knowing it not intellectually, but experientially. So I, I that, that's why I, I like for myself, my own practice, I like this foreground background analogy, very simple way for me to touch the silence of the background, the witnessing, the awareness, whatever you want to call it. And then there's the change in nature of the foreground. So I find that a very easy and simple uh, entryway, but then sustaining that. Ah, that's a whole other ball game. And even though I kind of understood that early on, my own uh, karmic conditioning was very strong, where I get caught up in the foreground of emotions and, and, and all the rest of it. And we're all the same that way. We're all that way. But if we don't get that, that basic understanding, then we're always just trying to get the objects right. And you can get them a little bit right, but it, 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 that's not really what transcendence is about. That's what worldly things are. So we do good things. We live good lives. We we practice dana. We take care of our elders. We care for our spaces. We care for the water and the trees. And and uh, we brush our teeth. We do all of that. That's all very, very important. Um, because if we did do that, it would just be chaos around us. So that's that's the sort of foundation of our, 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 um, our social lives. And as a bhikkhu, I'm so grateful for this social structure that I live in. But I didn't ordain just to be a bhikkhu, you know, just have this kind of identity or this kind of cool lifestyle or not cool lifestyle, but rather to use it as a vehicle for the liberation from suffering and, and to understand what this pointing to the unconditioned, what that's about. Now, Lompa's teaching also um, has, has a grounding in his own um, diligence. Uh, and he, he, he's, he, he's really an awesome practitioner in so many ways, in so many levels of his own being. Um, and I was thinking like, like to offer, to, to you know, wish Long Paul happy birthday, what, what might we do? Well, we can offer him flowers, that's sweet. But why don't, you know, why don't we offer something serious? like your life. Because <laughs> when Lumpa, Lumpa Sumedho went to Dong in India, he had done his, he had done, he had been a disciple for five years, so he was a, a Maji monk, and he could go and look at other monasteries, and, and you probably all know the story, and he, and he did Tudong Dong in India, and in the, towards the end of that year in India, he said, what am I doing? What am I doing? I think I want to go back to Lompo and offer my life to him. That's, and, and he knew what he was getting into. He was getting into a lot of complexity, well, you know, because he had already dealt with a lot of Westerners and they were complex beings, as I know. And um, he, he wasn't kind of taking something on that's going to be easy. He knew it would be difficult, but he gave his, you know, he really gave his life, a life to, to, to Long Po Cha and, and develop from there. So what 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 might we give Long Po? Well, if you if you were to emulate his yoga practice, 
Um, he had a he never he never taught yoga, interestingly enough, but I saw him do some back bends and splits and things which were just stunning. I mean, how can you be so flexible? And he was very quiet about it, but he was very, very diligent. Very, very diligent. So if you want to make an offering to Lompo, if you have a yoga practice, if you have a, a Tai Chi practice, if you have a Qigong practice, if you would anything like that, then strengthen it. Like for Lompo, I'm going to make this a serious thing. I'm going to, I'm going to stay with that good practices that I already have, with the yoga that I already do, the Qigong I already do, the Tai Chi I already do. I'm going to keep with those for a long, long time. That would be a nice offering, but very good for you too. Very, very good. Very good thing to do. And that takes diligence. That takes um, uh, a determination. But it's not the determination to become anything. So his determination wasn't to become anything, but it was to, to maintain very strong energy practices, a very strong grounded practices. You do that. What else might you do? Well, Lompo... He did his studies. You know, he's not, he's, he's well grounded in the text. But what he did, as we all know, he took the Four Noble Truths and he just kept working on that for a lifetime. So that's an interesting one where you take you take some basic framework from our from our tradition and you keep working it over. You keep reflecting on it, looking at different angles of it. And and he's always taught from that, but it's always so profound, isn't it? It's the same Four Noble Truths. So that's different than just doing sutta study. You can do sutta study after sutta study after sutta study and, and gain more and more information. But then usually that becomes encyclopedic and a kind of information um, collecting, which is fine, which is fine. But sometimes I think people can fool themselves think because you have a lot of concepts about Buddhism, you, you have actually, you've understood it. I think you have to take something quite basic, an Ichidukanata, Four Noble Truths, and really work with it, really, really deepen it. That's profoundly rewarding, profoundly rewarding. So there's that. You could offer your reflective capacities, your, your ability, your intelligence to constantly reflect on them. Not take views and opinions, but reflect on them. And and Lompo is so has been so to me so brilliant on on things like doubt. It's one of the most important things for from his teaching that I've taken on is that to see doubt as an object rather than be the doubting subject. To me, that's incredibly profound because my thinking mind can doubt and then look for an answer. Doubt, 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 ad nauseum, ad infinitum. But actually to see doubt is an object. This is a condition that comes and goes. And then there's the background of knowing. There's the awareness, which is not an opinion, which is which is no doubt is doubt. That was so liberating for me. I would forget it. I would get caught in doubts. But then, oh no, that's just doubt. Doubt feels this way. So that that reflective mind that Lopo has and it's so keen and so interesting we could offer that you know, to use the reflective mind more and use less of the um, believing mind, the opinionated mind, that kind of thing. Lompo is a very sincere man. You know, if you, we all, I think we're all amazed at how honest he is about his own troubles. You know, it's embarrassing sometimes the stuff he talks about in his own heart, isn't it? I mean, really? <laughs> and yet he's so very honest. He's so honest, yeah. I did this and I have these kinds of states in mind and it's embarrassing and, and wow, you're so honest. So what is sincerity? Well, sincerity is not being two-faced, I suppose. You know, some people can be nice to this person, but not nice to that person, kind of cynical. Well, Paul, you know, he's a really sincere man, very, very sincere. So what's sincerity? And that sincerity to me is such a part of me, the sense of truthfulness, really being honest, not in a kind of self-critical way, but, but just awakening to one's inner world and taking responsibility for one's suffering or whatever it might be. Lopo also, he grounded his practice in, in, in very real things. So 
He did lots of pranayama, lots of breathing exercises. But as you all know, laterally, well, not laterally, actually, probably in 1977, he started to do it more diligently. He used the sound of silence. And that's an interesting part of his monastic life is that he found uh, a thing, kind of a thing, the sound of silence, and he just used that because that brought him to emptiness, to non-attachment, to non-grasping. He figured that out, and then he used it very, very diligently, very, very diligently. So do you have something like that? Do you have something that reminds you of the background? Now, it could be the breath. You could, you could observe the breath back and in and out, in and out, but you're not grasping or focusing on the breath. You're realizing there's the background which knows change. So that's one way to do it. You, 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 you feel, you get, you get a feeling for the silence of awareness, the silence of witnessing. You know, you have to get a kind of taste for that, the inspiration for that. Once you get that, then you start to find objects, sound of silence, out breath, something like that. But then the objects are just the changing thing. And your reference is the silence. So in this little meditation that we did, I suggested, notice the movement of breath. I wasn't asking for a hard focus on some part of it. Just notice the movement. And what is it that knows that? So if you have something that grounds you like that, then you start to combine both. You have an object, in this case, breath, sound of silence, but your reference, it's not about the breath or the sound. It's about silent witnessing again and again. And you trust in that. So for myself, I use the, I use the heart. I find that the, the most interesting and compelling kind of uh, inquiry into, into my own being. So then I, I constantly use that. Oh, there's that. And there's the sound of silence, there's the silence, there's the space. And, and recently I've been talking with people who who um, have been kind of joking with the idea of a broken heart. And, and, uh, and, and what I've been contemplating a lot is, is, the, is, is remorse and, and, and relationships and how, how we hurt each other how through inadvertently, through words and actions, we can very often hurt the person very closest to us. And it's a, it's a, part of the problem is just habit, ingrained habit. But remorse to me is something of the heart. And remorse is a very important part, hideotipa, of our human consciousness. If we don't have remorse, of course, we're, we're monstrous. But when you when you begin to really awaken to the feeling that you have when you've hurt someone, when you said something which is cynical or uh, mocking or downright like a put down and so on, if you walk away, if you're really sincere, and I go back to sincerity, if you're really sincere about your own life, you'll say, where was that coming from? And you'll feel remorse. Now, now remorse is a healthy thing, but usually people take remorse into guilt. They hate themselves for having done something which they perceive as not, not, not sincere, not good, hurtful. Now, if you're if you if you go off into thought, you're not really with remorse, remorse anymore. You're with thinking. So remorse is a feeling, and it's a feeling in the heart. And what I found is that if I say something unskillful to someone, and I'm coming from a heedless place, I go back to my cutie, and I don't, I don't feel good. I feel, I feel the remorse in my heart. And my habit had been to go into thinking, either hating myself or figuring out how I'm going to do forgiveness, and. I realized I was not really being aware of remorse. So I recalibrated my prayer. I said, no, you have to stay with the heart. Stay with the heartfelt feeling of having hurt someone. And if I did that, and I do that, 
hopefully not too often I have to do that. But if I if I go to that, then it's actually a very it's not a, a feeling I want to stay with because it has this unpleasant quality of I just hurt some. But what it does, if I stay with it, it opens into love because it is love. Remorse is a kind of love. Love of the good, love of compassion, love of not hurting someone. If I don't stay with that and I go to thought, then there's the ego again. There's the becoming. There's the guilt. If I'm not sincere, then it doesn't really matter. I just hurt people and walk away and say it's their problem. Well, that's another issue. But most of us are sincere. Most of us feel that. We don't want to hurt anyone, yet we do. Inadvertently, habit, uh, whatever it might be. So to me, that's a very important moment. That moment of pain in the heart is very, very and that's what I'm thinking of the broken heart. It's not like super broken heart, but it is felt in the heart. Now, if you if you have a, a, an embodied sense of that chakra, of that center, of what that feels like when there is compassion, what that feels like when there is joy, what that feels like when you can relate to your grandchild or whatever, if you've embodied that and witnessed that and so on, then its opposite, having hurt someone, will be very loud there and very significant. And if you listen to that, if you listen to that, that will take you deeper into love and you'll not do that again. You won't do it as strongly. Vice versa. If someone does that to you, if someone insults you, says something to you which is inappropriate and hurtful, and it happens, happens on the street, happens in family, um, that hurts. That really, really hurts. It's the same program. You go back to your kitty, and then now you feel that hurt. And then what, what will your thinking do? You're thinking we'll go to revenge or how you're going to tell them really where they're at and really sort their out, you know, really sort them out and tell them and then they can never do that again. Or you'll never speak to them again or blah, blah, blah. And the mind will create a sense of self and other. But if you stay with a hurt feeling, and this is what I mean by the broken heart, if you stay with that, that will also take you to love because you're hurt now. And, and you don't want to stay with that because it hurts. And so we go out in the thinking and so on. So I find the more I can stay with the background and then notice that within the background, there are very interesting objects. There is the breath. There is the sound of silence. These are part of reality. They're not constructs of my, of my opinionated mind or my thinking mind or my Buddhist mind or my Buddhist opinions. It's not that. I'm not thinking. And, and then I go to the heart and I feel that. I feel that when, 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 when someone um, is very, people are very kind to me. I'm a very lucky guy that way, very, very kind and very generous. So I feel a lot of goodness which comes to me. And I just try to just sit there, feel that, appreciate that. Uh, and then I'll have a memory maybe that, that comes up of having been hurt or mocked. Where's that? Where's that? That's here. Now take that to thought. And so I find that the more I, more I live in the heart, then that becomes a, a kind of interesting mirror to the thinking mind. So the thinking mind is, is my habitual um, fallback position, go-to place, and it's not very skillful. Thinking is habitual for me, and it goes into worry or into planning or fantasy or resentment or whatever. But if I just try to sort that out with more thought, it gets me nowhere. I start to think about how I can put an end to thinking, but it doesn't really work. But if I go to the heart and I start to abide with the heart, then the thinking mind becomes very, very obvious. That is an object. That is an object. Don't believe in it. And so the, the kind of sense of ego that's created through thought through all its dynamics that comes up, begins to be known as an object. Not because I've tried to get rid of thought, not because I've, I've, I've done some, something to get rid of it, more because now I, have, now I have another place of abiding. So, in, you know, I just like to share what I do, my, my hobby, as it were. So what I try to very much to do is to, like, notice thinking, how, to, how it affects the brain. What, what does the face feel like? You know, what's the pressure in the temples? 
What do the eyes feel? I get really a lot of body awareness. So when thinking arises, it's 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 also got this um, component of bodily awareness. Yeah, there's thought, there's pressure in the brain, the eyes are tight, there's tension in the jaw, whatever. And then I just try to to to, to bring it down, feel my throat. What's the throat feel like? And if there's some emotional component, then the throat starts to feel tightness and openness and yawning and things like that. And I try to bring it down to the heart, bring it down. But I'm not, I'm not like focusing, trying to do some kind of samadhi practice. I'm just exploring the body, body awareness. What's the body feel like? What does the body feel like when it's happy, when it's sad? And so this, this is a reality. This is not a construct, a Buddhist construct. It's a reality. And as I, as I, as I abide with the heart, I find that's a place of wisdom. Actually, I can I can I can respond to people in a much more wise way when I'm when my attention is resting here. When it rests in thought, yeah, it's useful and so on. But oftentimes it's very diluted and, and its perceptions are warped by my family histories or whatever. It's not oftentimes don't trust that. Don't trust the thinking mind. So sometimes I, I you know I, I've been through Periods of just working through, as Lompo Semedo too, like through resentments coming up. And the voices of resentment, they're very real in some sense, but they're lying. I should do this and I should do that. I'm not going to forgive them. But no, what's the heart feel like? It feels like this. So you have this, this, this you know, like in, in thinking of, of, of Lompo's own practice, he had that, he has that great sense of, I shouldn't talk of, you know, I should let him speak for himself, but for my sense of it, he has that great sense of openness and, and silence and emptiness. He loves the, the Akasa meditations, but then he's, he's used things like the sound of silence, yoga, to ground himself in reality. So in, in offering something to Lompo, can't, like, do, you, do, you, do you get a sense of when he's talking about the unconditioned? Do you have a sense of that? Do you have a sense of something that's not an object? Have you got that insight? The unconditioned. What is not what is not conditioned? Awareness. Does awareness have is awareness yellow? Is awareness salty? Is awareness Singaporean? Is awareness male? Is awareness female? Is awareness 77 years old or 32 years old? None of those, right? It's ridiculous to say awareness is yellow. Awareness knows yellow. Change it to green. Awareness knows green. 77-year-old body, 90-year-old body, 32-year-old body. Is awareness 32 years old? It knows 32-year-old uh, body. But it's not 32, it has no age. When you think you're born, when you think you're 90 years old, it's already a problem. So that to me, it seems so fundamental to, to entering into the kind of teachings that Lopo Sumedho, Lopo Cha, and, and the Thai tradition of Puru, be the knowing, is, is pointing to. If you understand that, if you get that, if you, if you, if you have a glimmer of that, then you'll see how very difficult it is not to get caught up in objects, not to get caught up in, in self-identities and 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 uh, all, all the rest of it that we that we get caught up into to the thinking mind. So then you start to mature in the practice and you start to question what what is it about my conditioning? Where does the sense of self always get grounded into? objectivity into being a person let's say it is resentment you notice that actually 50 percent of my thoughts are resentful now you're starting to be aware of the problem and the problem is not the resentment it's the attachment identity with resentment then you start to see what lopo is saying when he says Trust and awareness, trust and awareness. So resentment comes up, 
But now, you know, okay, I've got to, you know, I want to work on this resentment for the next 10 years. Give it time. <laughs> so then the resentment comes up. You say, resentment is like this. It's changing. And you witness it. And you witness it. And you witness it. You witness it. And this is why Lopo is saying, trust and awareness. Just trust and awareness. Don't trust the analytical mind. Or just trust and awareness. Know it as it is. And if you can trust in that, then what happens is, as I was saying in the talk last time with this group, is the Anusai, the Lake in Tennessee, the Kalesa, they begin to just have no, no more fuel. You're not fueling them anymore. Upadana, the word for attachment, is also the word for fuel. So if resentment comes up and I can't witness it as an object and I fuel it with thought or I try to get rid of it with distraction, it won't end because I'm refueling it. That's attachment. But if I know resentment's like this, anxiety is like this, and I do that religiously, day in and day out, minute upon minute, then that's a huge practice we can offer Lone Paul. I'm gonna I'm gonna take responsibility for the anxiety rather than just thinking anxiety, anxious thoughts. I'm gonna take responsibility for um, whatever doubt or whatever. These these are objects, and then then you see how profound one plus practice has been where he's 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 taken that that simple paradigm that simple model of awakening knowing the way things are and trusted in that trust 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 what doesn't trust is 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 craving craving doesn't trust it wants something else so if you're sitting with a feeling of remorse and regret you're sitting with your heart Craving mind won't want that. It will want to get rid of that through self-hatred, through distraction, through food, anything, but feel the pain in the heart. But if you sit with the pain in the heart, that's when you start to say trust and awareness. Just trust. No, 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 just trust. This. Go to that feeling. Go to that feeling. Go to the broken heart. One poor child would say, when you've cried three times, you might have some wisdom. When you've cried three times, you might have some wisdom. And it's true when, when something really uh, impacts us like that. And I'm not hoping for anyone having any grief in this life. I hope you're happy all the time. Nothing ever happens wrong. But if it does happen, what to do? What to do? Where can you go? Um, you can go to distraction, but most of us have done that. It doesn't work. You can go to thought. Does that really work? Or you can go to the body and, and witnessing and awareness. And it's like this. And then witness change. So to stay with the heart, sometimes it's not easy. So you develop the heart in other ways. In ways it is easy. You bring up, like you bring up the memory of someone you love. One of the things about this monastery for me has always been that there's always been a um, a subtext for me, and that's my mother. Because before my mother died, she said, you know, she lived to be 97. And she said, you know, she couldn't figure out why she lived so long. She was definitely past her use by date. And she was ready for an exit. And, and yet, she lived to be 97. She wasn't partying, so she was she was ready to go. And, and that in the last year of her life, she said, you know, maybe, maybe the reason I lived this long is so you could build that monastery. And that's always, that's always touched me very deeply. And so I used that memory and I use my mom's picture. And I talk about this a lot because it's, it's actually, it's a kind of subtext in my life. And it's the subtext of the open heart within all the, all the kind of organizational things that I do and, and such like. Always that reference, the open heart, is terribly important for me. And, and, I, and I try to revive that in all kinds of ways. But it's very simple, actually. It's, it's the open heart. Um, and then as I do that, and I, and I live my day, then when the heart closes, oh, yeah, that's that other feeling, into resentment or worry, whatever it might be, then return, return to the open heart. And that's actually quite, quite simple. And then my conversation with the world, when it comes from the heart, 
seems to be much more appropriate, seems to be much more, it doesn't have any echoes of regret or remorse. It seems to be much more accurate. It seems to be wise from there. From my head, not, not very good sometimes and getting worse as I go, as I get older. Um, so these are things I do. And, and the, in the, you know, the subtext is my mother, but the subtext is also my gratitude to Lopo. How can I honor my teacher? And what would he want from me? He want me to happy. He want me to be liberated. Um, and, and if I can offer him that, surely that is what any teacher wants, right? That's what you want for your kids, right? You want your kids to be free from suffering. And that's what our teachers want. And so Lompo wants for us the, the very best, the very highest, the very most noble. And, and, and his offerings now are so profoundly good, so profoundly good. So I offer that for my teacher. They won't. Andamayam o vadagatha sadhu karan kadamasi sadhu 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 anumodami questions for anyone? Michael Zito, how are you? We'll see you soon. All right. I'll be I'll be in the airport in Toronto, so look for me. Good to see you both. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Look forward to it. Questions, anyone? Comments? Anyone with questions or comments? We're very grateful to Lampa Viradharma for sharing such um, deep and heartfelt reflections on Lampa Sumedho. He's a great being. I had a good fortune of spending the last weekend with him, so I can fully appreciate what you said, Lampa. Anyone's got uh, any reflections? Um, any comments? Any complaints? <laughs> <laughs> we do it all here. But there's no refunds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone? Well, should we chant the um, sharing of blessings through the goodness? Yes, Lampo, but uh, can we add in an extra chant to today? Can we do the um, the Buddha's words on loving kindness first before the sharing? Uh... Sure. Yeah, we have a we have an we have a group here. Buddha's <laughs> words of loving kindness and then sharing. Yes. Got that up on the screen. Coming up. You'll mute everyone else and we'll chant from here, okay, Peter? Uh, yes, Lampa. Okay. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. <clears throat> Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, Contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature. Let them not be the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety. May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, <clears throat> those living near and far away, those born and to be born, May all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another. 
or despise any being in any state. Let not correct your children who wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child. So with a boundless heart, should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness all over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. And verses of sharing and aspiration. Through the goodness that arises from my practice, may my spiritual teachers and guides of great virtue, my mother, my father, and my relatives, the sun and the moon, and all virtuous leaders of the world, may the highest gods and evil forces Celestial beings, guardian spirits of the earth, and the Lord of death, may those who are friendly, indifferent, or hostile, may all beings receive the blessings of my life. May they soon attain the threefold bliss and realize the deathless through the goodness that arises from my practice. And through this act of sharing, may all desires and attachments quickly cease and all harmful states of mind until I realize Nibbana in every kind of birth. May I have an upright mind with mindfulness and wisdom, austerity and vigor. May the forces of delusion not take hold nor weaken my resolve. The Buddha is my excellent refuge. Unsurpassed is the protection of the Dhamma. The solitary Buddha is my noble guide. The Sangha is my supreme support. Through the supreme power of all these, may darkness and delusion be dispelled. Hey everyone, nice to be with you. Oh, there's some flowers for Long Paul. Very nice. Yeah, think of him. Inspire your mind with his teachings and be free. <laughs> okay. Uh, let us all now the offer of gratitude to Long Paul Viradamo, who's led us in a very special gathering today of the global community by paying respects by chanting Araham. Uh -huh. Praham Sama Sambudo Just bow three times. Buddha Bhagavantam Aviva Devi Lanksabhaka Swaka Do Bhagavata Dhamma Dhamma Nama Sam Subhadi Bano Bhagavato Savata Sangha Sangha Naman Hey everyone. Don't worry, be happy. Thank you, Lampa. Be yeah. well. See you Bye -bye. next time. Ciao. See you Bye -bye. next time. Namaste.